This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member told by himself in his own fashion on April the 9th of 2007. These interviews are being audio taped in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television. And this is an attempt to preserve as much data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. With me today in Hollywood is a pioneer, film distributor, and former radio man, Dalton Dannon. Dalton, welcome to the microphone. Hi, Jerry. We uh, usually start these things out by going back to the very beginning, and if you'll tell us a little bit about when you were born, where you were born, and a little bit about your, your history as a child. Well, I was born in Central Iowa in a small town named Lehigh, L-E-H-I-G-H, kind of a Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer town, right on the Des Moines River with a one-and-a-half block long Main Street, street which paralleled the Des Moines River. So if we wanted to go fishing or fall in, we could uh, very easily access that opportunity. Uh, there was a railroad bridge at one end of town. The railroad ran right down the center of the main street. When it came through, it was strictly a freight railroad and went up to Fort Dodge. And uh, it is a wonderful, idyllic kind of, a, of an experience to remember all the rest of your life because, it's, as I said, Tom Sawyer kind of a thing. How about and, your family? Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, uh, I have no brothers and sisters. Uh-huh. I, I was born, uh, and you can probably see, clip this, I was born out of wedlock oh, really? in uh, this little town. My mother was going to nurses training in Fort Dodge and uh, met probably a very charming and opportunistic young intern, and I was the result. Oh, and, uh, aren't you glad? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm really pleased. Yeah. And uh, in small towns in those days were a little difficult difficult to yeah. have out of wedlock children, but anyway, it was everybody treated me as though I were a regular guy, Super. and I had a great growing up period until I was ten and a half years old, and I went to live with my mother and a new father mm-hmm. uh, in uh, in uh, California. Ah, they were out here. Uh, yes, they 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 had they had met in New York. They had moved to Dallas. They had. Transferred from Dallas, to California. They were both in the uh, in the beauty business, as it was sometimes called. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad was a hairstylist and uh, owned a salon in New York City. My mother studied in Des Moines, Iowa, to be a uh, hairstylist, and uh, they met that way. And so I moved up to out to California with them in 1935. Okay. My grandparents moved out too at that time. Oh, good. So you had other family here. So, right. So. Uh, did you come to, to the Los Angeles area? Yes, mm-hmm. right, right straight to Los Angeles area. They were living down around uh, an area which is now in pretty difficult circumstance, down around 8th and Alvarado mm-hmm. in a multi-story apartment building. And we soon moved to north New Hampshire between uh, 3rd and 6th. And it was a very nice area. And uh, I went to uh, to uh, one semester at 3rd Street School, and then I went mm-hmm. to... Uh, John Burroughs Junior High School, which is just down the street from here, a matter of a few feet, actually. No, <laughs> and then I went to Los Angeles High School. And uh, then uh, December 7th, 1941, things started to happen when I was uh, going to graduate summer 42 from Los Angeles High School, which I did, fortunately. And uh, decided that... Uh, First, I, I had planned, my mother was anxious for me to become a dentist, and somehow I, I didn't take enough pre-med courses or chemistry, physics in high school, mm-hmm. so I was going to go to City College, which I did for about six weeks, and I said, I don't want to do this, I'm going to go in the Air Force, uh-huh. and my father said to me, what do you want to do in the Air Force? I said, I want to be a pilot, but I don't have good enough grades, I don't think I can pass that screening exam, and he said that go down to the library, you can probably get a copy of the screening exam. It wouldn't be the same exam, but it'd show you what it looks like. You can do anything you want to do. Now, this was the Army Air, Air Corps? It was the Army Air Corps in right. those days. 
that's what I say the Air Force indirectly. Yeah. So long story short, I became a pilot in the Air Force. I was a twin engine advanced flight instructor at first. I went to Randolph Instructor School after I got my wings mm-hmm. in Douglas, Arizona and twin engine advanced training and uh, went through West Coast Training Command to Larry, Rankin Academy, Merced, etc. Mm-hmm. Graduated in Douglas in uh, February the 8th, 1944. Really? And uh, went to Randolph Instructor School for about five, six weeks and taught a couple of classes at uh, at uh, Douglas, Arizona, which I enjoyed, and I was a pretty young guy by then. Yeah, I guess. No, no overseas experience at that point? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. later. Huh. And uh, they were, the war was going so well, they were starting to diminish the cadet training activities. So I had a choice of staying at Douglas and becoming a citizen engineering officer, for which I was pretty badly qualified except by pilot training. Mm-hmm. I had no really uh, mechanical engineering training, even though I loved to pound nails and, and twist wrenches. So uh, we... Uh, I was given an opportunity. They would post uh, opportunities to move to other facets of the Air Force because they were cutting back on the training command. Mm-hmm. So I saw a B-25 transition school scheduled on the bulletin board in Greenville, South Carolina, and I promptly walked into the CEO and said, I want to go to B-25 transition school. Mm-hmm. I'd always hoped to fly B-38s. Oh, boy. But, Those uh, were exciting aircraft. Yeah, they were. But B-25s were great, and, of course, they yeah. became historical icons. Mm-hmm. And uh, what were 30 seconds over Tokyo and the, all those things, and I love flying the airplane. I flew that in combat in the Pacific, uh-huh. in the Central Pacific tra- Command. And uh, I was over there from, let's see, on about February to January 45 to... Uh, the end of the war was in August, I think, 45, if I recall mm-hmm. accurately. Right. And I didn't have enough, quite enough points to come home, and I was fooling around on a GI motorcycle on him when I pulled those trail up in the hills with a buddy I'd met from California. Then he fell in front of me. I ran into his rear wheel, went off a 35-foot drop, <laughs> went into the hospital for about six months, phoned back on a, on a hospital plane. They had C-54s in those days, and they went with three tiers of canvas litters on the walls of the C-45, C-45, not the C-4, C-54, 54. C-54, 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 C-45 a Beechcraft twin. Yeah. And uh, uh, I went to Letterman General up and, because I had a shattered left wrist and a shattered elbow and dislocated. Mm-hmm. All of my right, my right bicep severed in a concussion, and uh, my only concern was that I could fly again, and I was able to fly again. Oh, good. So I flew a general around for a couple of months, mm-hmm. ended up at Brooksfield in San Antonio, Texas. You know, are we spending too much time on this military mm-hmm. stuff? No, we're just talking about it. You, uh, you, but you, you made it through the war with no, with no problem flying airplanes. That's right. So your only injury came from a motorcycle. And through combat. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I was a, a bad motorcycle rider. Yeah. That was just the first time I'd been on one in my life. Good. And uh, this guy said, you've got to go cloud trailing with me. This is really funny. He was right. zigzagging in the trail. He slid down. I ran against his rear wheel. Went on the 35-foot drop because it was a bulldozed trail up oh, in the, in the, the Well, how did you get into the broadcasting business? <laughs> well... I came back from the Air Force, and I always wanted to go to USC, and you had to take an, a, an exam to get into USC, and on the GI Bill, but the, they had that certain, apparently limited qualifications, but I slid squeaked by an mm-hmm. X exam and seemed to be accepted for training. So I t- uh, signed up for classes. Of course, I'd been in the Air, Air, for, Air Corps slash Air Force coming up for three years and ten months. So I had quite a bit of, uh, of uh, experience behind me in growing up, and I was actually substantially younger than most of the students because there were guys going to school on the GI Bill, but still uh, it was kind of an adjustment to make going yeah. to school with a 18, 19-year-old uh-huh. uh, guy, people. And uh, nevertheless, I went for one and a half semesters and decided I wanted to see. I was studying advertising major, oh, marketing awesome. and advertising. I told mm-hmm. Dad... I had good uh, uh, good 
aptitude for art. Oh. And I could sketch and draw and mm-hmm. design and stuff. And I told Matt I thought I'd like to be an artist. And he said, why don't you go to get, it, get something related to art? I said, well, what about advertising? He said, that's a good mm-hmm. idea. Sure. So he said, you can use that creativity. And he had a great effect on him. He was a stepfather and a mm-hmm. great, great guy. He had a strong influence. And he was the hairdresser, you said? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. And he got the super guy. He was at, he was at the J.W. Robinson's downtown in what oh. they called the Antoine Salon, which mm-hmm. is a mm-hmm. high class. Like Claudette Colbert would go there and Gene Arthur, and sure. I met different people there. So, so you met some of those people as, yeah, as a, I did, at a young age? As a kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gene Arthur took my breath away. So, as a young <laughs> kid. So, uh, I, uh, so advertising was the thing that you were aiming for. That's what I was aiming for because of the, the semi-relationship to creativity and art, right. doing art and illustrations and things of that sort. Mm-hmm. So I ended up uh, then, uh, let's see, I, went, I stayed one and a half semesters at USC, and I went to work. The first job I had out of that time, let me let me check it very right quickly. As a matter of fact, I should have. I studied this last night at about midnight. So let's see. I went from there to. Uh, actually, I left. It's not on here, but I went to work at Hoffman Television for a friend of mine who was the advertising manager, mm-hmm. with whom I had been in the Air Force. A guy named Bud Lewis from Boston, Massachusetts. And television and was brand new in those days. Exceedingly. Sure. But. Hoffman Television was making a Cadillac-style right. television set, handmade, handmade cabinets. Mm-hmm. Beautiful wood, thing. Art, beautiful thing. And uh, I went to work there as an assistant ad man, manager. Well, not first. Just as a kind of a copywriter and run around and kind of a thing. And there's a guy that called on me in those days named Leon Ray. Leon Ray was a remarkably good-looking, gray-haired prematurely gray-haired, square-jawed gentleman with a, who he could have been an, an announcer. He had one of those voices with great timber, and he said uh, mm-hmm. to me one day after we'd known each other for a while, and he took me out for lunch at the little place down on Figueroa that used to be there near the USC campus, a woman's name, which I don't recall right now. He said, uh, listen, he said, did you ever think about being in radio? I said, no, I hadn't thought about it. He said, well, he said, we have a crew at KHJ, and he said, some of the guys have been there a long time, and they'll be wanting to move on, or, and we want to kind of get some new young guys. Hmm. And I, I must have for- fortunately not said too many incorrect things to him. <laughs> and he said, would you like to think about it? I said, sure. He said, okay, come on up and meet me at Nicodell's for lunch someday. And I said, okay, and we walked in, and Leon was this dapper, mustached, wavy, white hair. That's not very unlike yours. And uh, he said, uh, are you, what kind of a drink are you going to have? I said, oh, I don't really drink. I said, I wasn't a teetotaler, but I said, I'm not a drinker drinker. How old were you at that point? Uh, that would have been, uh, let's see, about 1950. One, so 26. Uh-huh. You know, I had had drinks in the Air Force, but, sure. not, but with the guys, and mm-hmm. but I didn't know regular drinking overseas. And you know, it's, it's, yeah, yes, you just don't do a lot of that. It's just not too much access to the opportunity. No, indeed. And uh, it wasn't something I created a taste for. My parents had been t- good to me in that, my teens. They'd say, "Do you want to taste this?" And I'd taste it. And I'd say, "Oh, it's, I can't stand it. It tastes like perfume." Yeah, you know, it's dreadful. <laughs> Right. So I, it wasn't any mystery to me. I just didn't care for it. Sure. And I had I had tied a couple on when I was the Air Force mm-hmm. on a troop train once going from Merced mm-hmm. down to uh, to uh, kind of South Carolina. Mm-hmm. We'd stopped in Los Angeles for a 40-minute layover. But they said, we all got to go get a bottle. So some of us ran off the train down at Union Station and brought them. All you could buy then was tequila, I meant maybe tequila or Three, three, four, four, four roses or three roses. Or four six, roses. Four yeah. roses, cheap yeah. bourbon. So we got a bottle of tequila, and three or four of us sat there and drank it out of the bottle. Oh, yeah. And I got sick, and so <laughs> I didn't care for that much. No, either. I can imagine. <laughs> but anyway, this fellow offered you a drink. Long story, then. I said, okay. He said, well, you really ought to have a drink at lunch. And I 
because that's it's sort of the thing. It, it cements your relationship. It gets relaxed. And he said, well, I said, I'm going to have it. He said, I'm, he said, I'm going to have this martini straight up. Got Nicodell. If anybody remembers Nicodell's, their martini straight up came. Nicely chilled in a beautiful glass with a little jug with the rest of the drink. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, you know, a little one well, that's yeah. yeah. So it was a substantial drink, and right away <laughs> I realized I didn't care for the taste at all, but I was trying to be sociable, get sociable, yeah. and get a, and establish a certain rapport. Right. And he said, oh, "Would you like a second?" And I said, "No, thanks." So long story short, I didn't quite know how the interview came out. It was very cordial and very nice. So he uh, said, uh, would you like a second drink? I said, no, thank I said, I, I really feel this. And mm-hmm. I said, I think that, that I would be out of control if I had a second one. So that, long story short, I uh, left the lunch. She said, oh, I enjoyed it very much, and I'll be in touch. I thought, oh, God. Now, what position were you interviewing for? Was it on on air? An account exec. An account exec. Account exec Uh at KHA Radio. Okay. Go ahead of that major omission. Mm -hmm. So uh, he phoned me the next day or two, and he said, "Don't we'd like you to come on board with us? Uh, Come on up here if you can, and we'll uh, we'll uh, talk about your deal." Mm-hmm. So they gave me, they had a standard basic deal, and sure. they, everybody had the same base, and you had a percentage of your sales, and it was sliding scale, and, they, and some, of, some of the percentages varied on the difficulty of sale of the programs, and it was a tremendous training ground. I learned to, mm-hmm. to deal with ratings and research and all the other things that I'd never known much about. Yeah. And, the uh, building blocks of a good career in broadcasting. Remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, and they were... Caring. There was a guy named Terry Lee who was assistant sales manager, and Leon Ray was sales manager. And Norman Boggs was the president of radio, and Ward Ingram was the president of radio and television. And we were on the third floor at the 1313 Vine Street mm-hmm. uh, with uh, television and radio. We were both up there, and CBS was on the second floor. Then we had stages on the ground floor, both for both, both the radio and television. Hmm. And uh, all the program people were on the ground floor, too. So it was a tremendous introduction to the industry. Well, I guess. And it, it uh, really whetted my appetite, and I found it. That, as I mentioned in the uh, chapter in the book of how I got the job in television, yeah, yeah. there's a reference to it. I was walking down the hall one day, coming back from calls, ran into the two people. So if you want to refer back to that, to embellish, I, well, I don't know why, but you want to sit and listen to the old story again. It's in the book. But uh, anyway, I met this man in the hallway. It was a big wheel with a company called MPTV, which is a television program uh, distribution company. Mm-hmm. They were selling feature films and television half-hour series and, uh, and made, for mo- made, for, made for motion picture theater serials mm-hmm. like Buster Crab and Flash Gordon. With, they get, like, they Probably say. should explain to folks listening to this later on that in the early days of television, there was no such thing as a as a, a network that f- reached the entire United Stra- States at one time. So uh, stations out here in the West, particularly, were starved for programming. That's true. Well, they, they had to have programming supplied on film or in a kinescope recording. On kinescope, right. primarily at that time. So there was no really live broadcasting in the West Coast to speak of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my first territory was uh, Montana and Wyoming and Oregon and Washington small markets. Right. They didn't send the trainees. They were just beginning in the <laughs> syndication radio, uh, te- television syndicate program syndication business into the major markets. But mm-hmm. I, my first call was in Great Falls, Montana. My second call was in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Mm-hmm. And my third call was in Boise, Idaho, etc. And all those little one one station towns, right. and some of them were not yet not, on not the, even on the area. Not on the air. Falls. Not uh, on the air. Dalton mentioned the book. The book we're referring to is a beautiful book, uh, a chapter written by a lot of people who were in this business at the time, called Fridays with Fridays with Art with Art Art Greenfield. Oh, Art Greenfield. Yeah. So, uh, it, uh, reading the chapter on Dalton, I was just amazed to find that his first job in Great Falls, Montana, selling programming was to a man that I later went to work for as my first full-time job out of college. 
a guy named Joe Wilkins. And when you were there, KFBB television was not yet on the air. That's right. Channel yeah, 5 came on the air just before I got there in August of 1954. And, and you were there in 53. 53. So it's a small coincidence there. It would have been November 53. Uh-huh. So it was, it was probably in the, pl well, probably was in the I've construction been, stage. I'd been with the, the, in that job for about two weeks, but I'd, they'd given me reams of material to read and absorb mm -hmm. for about two weeks, and I sat in an office out on the Sunset Strip at 9100 Sunset and read program schedules and, and rating, or taught to read ratings and books and things of that right. sort. And uh, um, then this man named John J. Cole took me on the sales trip where we started in Seattle. Mm -hmm. you know, San Francisco is Seattle, Great Falls. Amazing. And... Uh, now, what, what kind of rates were, were television stations in the Northwest getting in those days? Were well, these are one-station markets. One-station markets. And probably uh, the average size of the markets I called on were probably forty to 50,000 mm -hmm. people. Right. Great Falls was about a little over 50,000 yes, at that time. that's right. Most of them. The, the largest city in the state at that time. Forty to 60,000. They varied. Right. Then went to Yakima and others. But mm -hmm. anyway, and... Uh, basis of the rate card was the standard rate and data published proposed rates for the stations and we used the one hour prime time rate to calculate a fair price per telecast of the product we were selling mm -hmm. because we wanted it to be affordable but not too cheap sure. but too low priced we wanted it something they have a fair return on investment, something that would be good for them because this is a long-term business you're going to be doing. Hopefully, if you're lucky and your company survives it in those days, they weren't folding. They were growing. Mm -hmm. It's a very long-term relationship that's established for the broadcast. Yeah, right. And so you're as, you are as interested in their success as you are in your own. It's the only way to do business. Mm -hmm. And they have to learn to trust you that you will exactly. bring them a good product at a fair price. And I had a wonderful foot in the door, which I didn't realize. Almost all of these people in those days putting television stations on the air were radio people. That's right. 90% of them. Some were newspaper people, mm -hmm. but newspaper and radio. Mm -hmm. So when I walked in and introduced myself as a radio guy, that couldn't have been a better thing to say. No, they, they <laughs> identified. I was one of them. Right, right. Or a, a sort of one of them in any event. And, mo even and most of them didn't know beans about television like any no, of us in those right. days. <laughs> we and learned as we went along. And I learned as I went along. And we became a great source of knowledge for the television operators because we went from city to city sure. calling on stations. And we would see the successes and failures right. of programming in the various cities which we were then able to communicate to mm -hmm. the next station I went to. They'd say, I'd say, oh, boy, Highway Patrol is doing great in Boise. But I wasn't selling Highway Patrol, but something, you know. You were, you were in a way of what became a consultant, weren't you? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, were, we were an avenue of information Absolutely. based on direct contact. Mm -hmm. Not, and uh, we had another thing, the company that I went to work for at that time was the major had one of the major libraries of feature films, and there were no major studios selling movies at that time. Because the theater owners were threatening the studios if they sure. sold the television, we're not going to play your movies. Uh -huh. So these were mostly older movies from various sources. A mass, we had about 300 pictures at that time, and some of them went back 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. almost all of them black and white. We had some great movies and some average B, lots of B movies, with uh, Johnny Mac Brown and <laughs> and, and all that got you know, sure. and Gabby Hayes. Gabby Hayes. And so we had Bob Steele. Yeah, you know, everyone was saying in those days that television was going to kill radio and motion pictures. That's right. Everybody's going to be able to stay home and see all the entertainment they wanted, and nobody would go to the movies. That's, that's I mean, I should have said that you said perfectly. Yeah. That's a, that's the bad, as a matter of fact, the basis for my vulnerability 
when I was offered that job in te- te- television program syndication because <laughs> I wasn't really crazy about the idea of traveling three or four or five days a week, mm. three or four weeks a month. I was just getting married at that time. Uh-huh. And I couldn't comprehend quite how I could make a new marriage work and be out of town most of the time. <laughs> that's right. Pretty hard. But somehow, anyway. But, uh, well, you, then M- MTTV Guild Films uh, uh, survived. Guild Films, certainly, I recall yes. from my early days in television. Then you went on to Medallion TV? Yes, and that there was a friend of mine named John Edlinger. Well, he wasn't a friend of mine at the time. I met him, knew him casually. Uh, MBTV and Guild Films kind of overspent and fell on difficult times. Ah. And I, by the, at, the, at that juncture, they asked me to come to uh, New York, and I was uh, for probably six months, five to six months commuting every two weeks between Los Angeles and New York and being general sales manager. And fairly newly married. <laughs> yes, and, and counting, exactly. And, and uh, counting paycheck to paycheck, mm-hmm. where we were the our treasurer was going to the bank to try to get some more financing on a couple of contracts that had come in that week. It was going to kind of nip and tuck. I bet. And so I was not too pleased with the being away two weeks at a time, missing every other weekend. Mm-hmm. So John and I, whom I'd met socially, he said, why don't you come over here and help me out? So that's how I ended up with John and her at Medallion TV. How so, did you I meet your wife and where? I met my wife at the Hollywood Studio Club shortly after I came out of the Air Force when I was just starting to complete my USC career. Ah. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a career. It was not a very short trip. Right. And uh, met at the Hollywood Studio Club where I had been taken and introduced to a lovely lady that I had gone with for for a few months, it was lovely, but she was moving back to Chicago. Her name was Ann Liberton, and she was a voice coach. Hmm. And I had a voice then. Yeah. <laughs> not, not like now, but she wasn't going to coach me, but we liked each other very much. And we established a wonderful relationship. And then she moved to Chicago, and I was there kind of by myself, uh, driving cab at night while going to USC. Uh-huh. This, right, this was before I met my wife. Sure. And that's the way I was going on the GI Bill. I drove yellow cab for nine hours each five nights a week and went to USC in the daytime hmm. and tried to carry 12 units, which was the minimum that they wanted to, units to take if you're going on the GI Bill. Mm-hmm. And I think there was a $70 a month financial assistance. So I, I'm bouncing back and forth. Uh, I met Loring at a annual Valentine's Day party at the Hollywood Studio Club, which is a... YWCA facility on Lodi Place, just east of the old ranch market, a couple of blocks, between Fountain and Santa Monica Boulevard. The big three or four story brick building. I don't know whether it still stands there. I'll drive by someday. She was not living there. She was there as a guest of a girl living there, thinking about moving out, living with her mother and grandmother in mm-hmm. Sherman Oaks. And she was kind of looking the place over, and she'd been invited to this dance. And I walked in with a buddy after dinner, because I'd known several girls there by then, and had great access and was always invited to their functions. And these are no-charge functions, and uh, I must have had a night off from driving cab, because I wasn't working that night. I think I'd probably had dinner in the anyway, to Nicodell's. And I looked at this girl across the room for about, 45 minutes and danced with several girls I knew at Studio Club. And she was tall, and I was six foot one and a half, and it's six, six feet one half now. Mm-hmm. It's shorter now. And she was about statuesque and beautiful and built go beautifully. And mm-hmm. So I finally walked over to her and I said, Would you like to dance? Well, by then, she and her girlfriend were very angry with my buddy and me because. We had not known them, and I was, it's hard for anybody to believe that I was shy. <laughs> that knows me now, but I was shy. I didn't know her, and she obviously didn't live there. And I was really cautious about going to ask a strange girl to dance, even though it was sort of that kind of a function, but it's not a pickup joint. It was a, you know, high-class little dance. And she kind of 
put, pushed me off a little bit. She said, no, 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 thank you, because they were mad at us. These two tall guys came in there. She, they were a tall girl. And they didn't, not every guy, they didn't really feel they could dance with very well. Sure. So anyway, we worked it out. I had a friend there who was going with a starlet at Universal Studios named Peggy Dow. <laughs> and uh, my wife, to me, worked at Universal for a producer. Her name is Loring Fontaine, and she worked for Robert Buckner, who was an Academy Award winning producer, writer. Hmm. And they had a little bungalow on the lot, which I later got acquainted with. Yeah. And we started dating each other. And I, I said, we're going over to Nicodell's after this. Dance is over. Would you like to go with us? And a bunch of us. She said, oh, I, I couldn't do that. We haven't been properly introduced. And I said, well, I'd sure like you to go with us. And so I went over to the Peggy Dow, who was Roger Hodgson's gal. She's the one that started contract start at Universal. They said, can you go tell Loring that uh, I'm an okay guy and see if she'll go with us for coffee and cake at Nick and Dale's after the dance. And she did just that. And that's what became a lovely three-year courtship and 47-year oh, marriage. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, you were then uh, a very young man. Yeah. And... Uh, you're not so young anymore, as we all are not. Uh, you, in the meantime, had gone on to where? KTLA, Golden West Broadcasters? Let's see. When I was with, uh, look at the sequence again now. Um, yeah. Um, I had not done that until after. Let me see. I'm skipping here. Though then I went. I went to uh, the Medallion TV, during which this, this, uh, laryngectomy occurred kind of throat cancer uh, and we dealt, tried to deal with it uh, orally and then finally did the full laryngectomy that must have been pretty devastating for a guy who had done it was. Uh, sales jo uh, yeah. work and I suppose you figured gee I, how can I sell with no voice I thought I would probably uh, maybe pump gas or yeah. work in a shipping room or something like that was that operation uh, fairly new, or had they been doing it for a few years? They'd been doing it for a while, but the success rate was not what it is today. Uh -huh. and, uh, I was in the hospital for 31 days oh, really? at what was then called uh, Mount Sinai. Mm. It wasn't Cedars. at Cedars without you. Right. I'd had a big, long series of radiation at Cedars preceding that, which my surgeon told me which had not occurred prior to this surgery because the radiation kind of turns the tissues in the liver. Sure. And he said it complicated the, uh, the, the surgery. How did how did you, uh, what were some of the symptoms you had that led you to the diagnosis? Prior, initially, it was uh, uh, chronic laryngitis, uh -huh. losing my voice slowly. And I called on a station in Seattle where I had known a program director for a long time. And he said to me, how long have you had that laryngitis? I said, oh, about three months, four months. He said, well, I'm going to send you that. He picked up a phone on his desk, phoned downtown. He said, you have an appointment this afternoon at 2 o'clock. I know the top stroke man in town. Mm. He said, I just made an appointment for you. Why don't you go down and have a take a look at that? So he put a mirror back there with lights and look, the bright light looking through the... The, yeah. the, like this, and he said, uh, you have an ulceration on your left vocal cord, and he said, you ought to see a doctor when you get back home. And I said, you know anybody in Los Angeles? He said, yes, Dr. Sam Kaplan. And so I should have stopped dropping my voice. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's probably making it hard to record me. I should face the mic. No, you're fine. Uh, so long story short, there was about a year of attempts to remove the ulceration on the cord and hoping it would heal mm -hmm. and it was not healing and not healing. There were two or three surgery, surgeries through the mouth mm -hmm. and then finally we gave up and said no we've got to have to do the laryngectomy they kept they kept diagnosing and they kept doing the laboratory work on each sample they took out and it was mm -hmm. continuing to be negative. So what year was that then? 1962. 62. Mm -hmm. So I, I was fully a, a full laryngectomy in, in September of 62. So then you had to learn, learn to talk a different yes. way. And I had a tube in my nose for six months 
In your nose. Feeding tube. Oh. Going to my stomach. Uh huh. Because I got staph infection in the hospital. Oh, dear. And it wouldn't stop and it wouldn't stop. And that's mm. the extent of the hospitalization from, as I said, from it should have been about a week, five days to a week, to about 30, 31 days. Mm-hmm. And then I came home with this tube in my nose because, the, because of all the excess radiation, the wounds would not meld together down there. So every time you would take a sip of water, it would go into your lungs. They have to re- they have to reroute all the plumbing. Yeah, sure. Down there and connects things apart. And as soon as I got that tube out of my nose, my surgeon <laughs> sent me to a voice coach, and he said to me, uh, "I couldn't speak. I could not make it sound, mm-hmm. of course, or any sort." And uh, he said, "Can you uh, can you burp on purpose?" Doctor Harrington, he said, at Highland in Hollywood Boulevard. And he said, can you burp on purpose? And I said, not in my head, yes. He said, let me see what you can do. And I went, burp. I mean, um, he said, that's pretty good. He said, can you say uh, A, A, B, C? And I said, A, B, C. He said, that's pretty good. Long story short, three lessons. He said, I can't do anything more for you. You're, hmm. you're, you're fixed. And we were driving home, and I became a magpie instantly. Because uh-huh. I hadn't been able to speak for over, I mean, really, for the six, the six months from the tube in the nose. Sure. And prior to that, I would, we could barely speak, too. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was, pretty, of course, there were, there were a lot of tears, but my wife and I shared yeah, having a good cry over it. Sure. And my first bite of food that I could have in my mouth was right around at that time. And we were over in Music City at Sunset and Vine. Mm-hmm. And next door was a little coffee shop or ham and egg or something. And we walked in there and uh, they said, You're going to have some soft food. And I had a bowl of jello, plain jello. And I took that first bite and then we had another good cry over that. I'll bet that tasted so good. <laughs> oh, yes, it did. <laughs> Wow. So life was starting to come back, and a dear friend of mine that I had met when I was uh, uh, <laughs> fooling around with racing, racing cars, because mm-hmm. I raced Corvettes back before that time uh, in the quarter mile and road racing and hill climbs and sl- slaloms and drums, any kind of yeah. activity. He owned an aircraft electronics connection business. He said, well, why don't you come to work for me while you're recovering? Hmm. So I did, and I became kind of the, 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 the handyman and helped in shipping, and I started buying parts and started drilling parts. How was our time doing? Very, about 15 minutes to go here. Okay, then we can probably cover mm-hmm. that because uh, I'm getting long-winded. Uh, uh, his name is Fred Sutherland. He virtually created a confidence in me which was totally lost with the surgery. Because I, I just couldn't conceive how I could ever, commu- if I couldn't communicate, I then couldn't visualize how I was going to mm-hmm. capture a career. So um, I went to work for him and, and I graduated right away. He gave me a raise in like a week because I was doing so many more things than we thought I could do. And, of course, I wasn't the great communicator at the time, but I was doing okay. Actually, I went to work for him before the surgery Mm -hmm. and after the surgery. And then a friend of mine was in town from New York that named Marvin Grave, and much of this is in the book. Mm -hmm. And he went to him general manager at KTLA Channel 5 his name was Seymour Adler and they called him Stretch Stretch Adler he said Marvin Grief said to Stretch Adler did you hear about Dalton Stretch said no well what about Dalton he said well he had his uh, larynx removed and he's uh, getting uh, getting well now and uh, he's able to speak he couldn't speak for almost a year and so forth and Stretch and I had worked with Stretch at MPTV Yale Films mm when I was in New York and even when I was out west he was our vice president of national sales uh-huh. he called on the networks and so forth he said uh, well tell him tell him to call me 
when he when he's able to speak. And I, I think I'd, you know, I'd like to have a guy like that here at KTLA. Hmm. So, and a few months later, when I could communicate, uh, I did actually. And he said, "I want, I want to see you. Come on in." And I sat down with him and Bob Quinlan, who was program director. And they said, "We need a good film director here. Mm-hmm. That's a guy that bought and scheduled the fe- feature films." And you and, knew them. <laughs> and film programming. Yeah, you you knew them backwards and yes, forwards. Yes, I did. Can I knew them from both sides of the sure. fence? And I did, and it, I, it was a great benefit for both of us. I'll bet. It was a great. First, it was great for me to have the opportunity. They gave me the chance to really come back to life in the industry, which I loved, mm-hmm. and uh, and find out you could function just fine. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I found that people that would sound very self-conscious about my voice can still occasionally. You don't see me stand up much at the meetings and mm-hmm. say things because I'm not sure I can project across the room. If I walked up to the mic, if I had something intelligent to say, I might do that. But Mm -hmm. reticent to do it with a strange crowd. But I found that people are remarkable. There's so many people we we're fixing all this gang banging stuff. We tend to think that people are (laughs) difficult, and so so many people have been so encouraging, get so helpful, and and listened so carefully when I would start calling on them. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled and rewarded by the kindness that people can lend to meeting somebody and it made my career come back to life. Mm, That's remarkable and very, very helpful. So you were at KTLA and then what happened after that? Okay. uh, Let me see. Okay. And Gene Autry bought KTLA. Stretch had her work for Paramount. Gene Autry bought KTLA. I was doing very well there for a year or so. They were doing a bunch of cutbacks. They had a great guy named Loring Dusso was their executive producer. And uh, I had a good friend and the general manager was Art Mortensen, who had been running a station in Bakersfield that I had worked with at KHJ Radio. Oh. So I had a good friend the general manager. And uh, he left and... Uh, the station and uh, I was there and I wasn't satisfying them at that the new ownership at that time as I had done for Paramount and uh, I sought sought a way out of that and uh, the man that I had met who was in syndication named Bob Seidelman owned his own company he said why don't you come to work and take over the sales management of a company called Teleworld so I became the West Coast guy, mm-hmm. and I actually ended up covering most of the country in certain key circumstances. Uh, what kind of product were you selling for Color World? Uh, feature films feature and, films. And, and, and some half hours. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 what's the it's a very attractive exercise girl? Debbie Drake. <laughs> Debbie Drake exercise show. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and uh, a mixed bag of movies. Not like that's not like Columbia Pictures, yeah. which would be later come along. And that's 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 yeah. like taking candy from babies when you have a major motion picture library. Oh sure. <laughs> and uh, but it was a great education. It was that we were together for a long, long time. Let's see, almost twelve years. And he made me sales vice president of the company, and uh, I met wonderful people all, all over all over the country. Mm-hmm. I had friends. I had a list. Uh, I made a list of references when I found that I might be looking for a job. And it's astonishing. In the back of the book, there's an addendum in the back of the book that lists people that I use as references yes, all over the United States. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That I was close enough to to put them down. Right. So he said at Teleworld for a few years, actually quite a few years. Yes. Then Polygram Television, I was about, then, then Columbia Picture Television, again through an acquaintance mm-hmm. opportunity. And I became a national vice president, and I ran feature film marketing for a syndication of all the Columbia Pictures in the United States. And Columbia was quite big in those days. Yes, they, were, they had a, about a 1,500 feature library, oh, yeah. but not all of which were syndicatable. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
by that because some of them went back in such, such early days. Sure. But it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I had a contract renewal coming up, and at the same time I had an offer from a former member of Columbia Pictures Television who had been president of the Worldwide Kimberly Pictures Television, and I'd worked for him for a few months before he left the company, but his dear friends were still there. And he phoned me when he went to Polygram as president of Polygram and offered me this job as executive VP, mm -hmm. sales and marketing at Polygram. Mm -hmm. Polygram was primarily a music company, but they decided they wanted to be a television oh, and feature film production in the United States. Yeah, Polygram Records, I do recall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had a year where they lost about $35, $40 million in their, mm. in their music business. And they decided they couldn't afford to be in motion picture and television program production. Sure. And we were on the uh, second floor of the producer's building on the MGM lot. And Laura Moore was on the third floor. And uh, I knew Ken Page, with whom I had worked at Columbia Pictures, who was then executive vice president of sales and marketing for U.S. television syndication. Mm. And uh, he said, why don't you come with us? Come on upstairs with us. And Lorimar. Get Lorimar. Uh -huh. And that was Dallas and not Slanding. Oh, yeah, all the big shows. And, and they wow. had bought the Allied Artist Library uh, of features, and they had a few independently produced pictures of their own. So there was a smaller library, but I created a package. Of, my first package that was, was created. Refresh my memory. Lorimar was uh, Norman Lear? No, no. no. It was... Uh, uh, it was uh, Uh, Merv Adelson, oh, Adelson and Lee Rich. Oh, Lee Rich, that's right. Okay. President and chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, Merv Adelson was chairman, Lee Rich was president. Gotcha. They're both very experienced, very successful in the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me all the great opportunities. I I virtually didn't make a change from, from the time I joined Lorimar until the time I left uh, Warner Brothers. Because Lorimar was bought by Warner Brothers. Uh -huh. And I made that transition, and uh, I left active duty there. So I stepped down twelve four ninety. I don't remember where I first uh, became acquainted with you. you. With you, I guess it's when you were with Lorimar, and later I do remember you at Warner Brothers, for sure. Yeah. When I was with Armed Forces Radio yeah. and Television. And I called on a guy, Vince, Vince Harris, of yeah, course. Yeah, sure. And uh, Jack Brown was a dear. Jack Brown helped court my helped me court my wife. Oh, Jack did? Yes, because really? Loring and Charlotte, who became uh, Jack's wife, I'll be there. were best friends at Universal Studios. For heaven's sake. And uh, so we double dated a lot. Uh huh. And we went off on weekends together. Oh. And these were, and this is not for part of this publication, They were these were platonic weekends. Nobody was uh -huh. sleeping with anybody. No. It was just two couples going and going to Palm Springs or going up to a little mountain cabin mm -hmm. and going to one of their aunts and stuff like that. Sure. And Jack Brown and Charlotte. Jack and Charlotte Brown and Lori and I double dated. Oh, for heaven's sake. Got That's very, very close. And I got in the Pioneer Broadcasters because of Jack Brown and Margot Ewing, whom I knew from Paramount. Uh -huh. and she worked for a dear friend of mine named Bob New York at Paramount. Oh, for heaven's sake. So all these little connections. Yeah, this is, it's just amazing how many... People that you knew early on yes. and later on become important fa facets yeah. in your life. Like, uh, it's just amazing. <laughs> well, Dalton, you've had a remarkable career, really. Yeah, are you doing anything now? Are you, are you totally retired? Or? I know. There's an addendum back here. And I worked as a, a consultant and an expert witness oh. into 1999. And you see, you'll notice the top here. Mm -hmm. It's the addendum. Okay, yep, see that. And, uh, it, these are a bit braggadocio, <clears throat> and, uh, but just informational for your information. Good. Uh, some of the consult consultancies and, uh, and expert witnessing. No, now, did. explain a little bit about that. What, do you, what, what kind of expert witnessing do you do? Uh, primarily, I worked on usually a producer is anxious to sue a distributor mm -hmm. because 
feature films are usually sold in cinema, not sold, licensed, licensed on a lease to the stations within a list of pictures, mm-hmm. a package as we call them. Right. Every producer always felt that his share of the proceeds from the sale of 20 pictures was not as high as it should have been within that package. Uh-huh. In other words, dude, why did you... We, I was only allocated X percent of that gross price, and the other picture, which wasn't as good as my picture, so and so I worked on a lot of those, mm-hmm. a lot of those, okay. and uh, it, it, and it, I apparently established a reputation because I received a lot of referrals and calls, which fostered my ability to have almost nine years of continuing mm-hmm. activity and income. Mm-hmm. One and also I would evaluate for a, a company and they would phone and say, Can you evaluate evaluate a package of movies for us? What do you think it's worth in syndication? I knew that for the first few years, but of course you come be, become obsolete in your knowledge mm-hmm. if you're not in the business actively as in marketing, your knowledge becomes obsolete very short order. Sure. So uh, uh. I had nine years of it's very nice to be phoned by people with whom I've done business over time. Indeed. And there's a list of some of them here. Fantastic. That, that addendum. Well, I've enjoyed very much talking with you this afternoon. Uh, anything else we need to add that will bring us uh, up to date? I, I, I think I took a lot of your time. Oh, I not my time. No, I'm here to serve. I hope it's so much, so much this productivity. Is, this is for posterity, for people who will come and, in and listen to these tapes later on. I found it, uh, as I reflect back, I wouldn't wouldn't trade it for anything. No, it's a remarkable uh, business. Not perhaps as uh, fun to be in anymore as it used to be? Not, no? at, not even close. Not even close. It's, it's a non, almost a non-business yeah. television program syndication. That's right. <laughs> because they're all group buyers now. Mm-hmm. There are very few individual station buyers. In those days, we would have sales staff at a company of six or eight account execs on the road. Sure. Every week, all the time, calling all, all individual, oh, some small groups, three station group, five station. But mm-hmm. well, you could only own five stations during most of the time that I was in the business. Mm-hmm. Now they own 25 stations and 30. Sure. Can they have a central buying point in the group pro? But there, there were some group program directors. Dick Woolen at uh, Channel 11 became a group program vice president for the Fox television station when it was still. Uh, L.A. Times broadcasting, yeah. and he's an old friend, close friend because of that, mm-hmm. still a dear friend. And there were a lot of people like that. Bob Guy, who ran programming for the Star Station, became a close friend. And mm-hmm. I, they're too, too numerous to mention, but a lot of Merlis in the back of the book. Well, your name has been uh, one of highly respected in the industry for a lot of years. I remember hearing about Dalton Dannon when I first went to work for Armed Forces Radio and Television. Really? Yeah. That's very complimentary. So, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Well, it's been a pleasure to be asked. I'm honored. We've been talking with Dalton Dannon here at, on April the 9th of 2007 for this Pacific Pioneer Broadcaster's archival history. And uh, this is Jerry Fry, the audio historian of PPB. Thank you very much for listening.